you. I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri people, and their elders past and present. Two days ago on the 9th of May, Parliament House celebrated its 30th birthday. The Canberra Times on 9 May 1988 unsurprisingly devoted a great deal of attention to the opening of the new Parliament. Only people who have worked in the present 61-year-old provisional Parliament House, one journalist commented, can truly understand how necessary a new building has become. The old building quite simply was bursting at the seams. And yet, among the pictures of the marble-clad pillars of the front veranda, the gleaming halls and the absolutely superb craftsmanship, the state-of-the-art facilities that we have in this place, there were anxieties. Would government and opposition parliamentarians and journalists bump into each other in the new building? Should ministers and their staff be housed in a separate wing? Would this be the end of the doorstop interview? Clearly not, but... And would it be the end of noisy demonstrations that were within earshot of the chambers? Today's speaker, Professor Kim Dovey, has pondered some of those questions himself a decade after the building was opened in his book, Framing Places, Mediating Power in Built Form. With the passage of 30 years, we've invited him here to revisit the relationship between buildings and power. Kim is a professor of architecture and urban design at the University of Melbourne and has published and broadcast widely on issues in architecture, urban design and planning. Please join with me in welcoming Professor Dovey to speak on architecture and power, how do buildings shape politics? I may have shifted you onto the wrong side there. But, uh... Thank, you. thank you very much and uh, thank you all for, for coming. Um, it's, uh, so Parliament House is 30 years old and um, because Buildings are not just piles of marble and concrete and bricks and mortar. They are um, they're living buildings, buildings that have a life cycle. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so I think we should say happy birthday. And on occasions like this, it's customary um, not to offend the host or the, the, the birthday celebrant, to, 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 to put it more accurately. Um, but I have been asked to talk about the relationship of buildings to power. And um, since the only thing that I published on this, as was pointed out, was like 20 years ago, was reasonably critical. Uh, and not much has changed. Um, I hope you'll forgive me if I um, continue uh, it with a critique, really a more general critique, first of all, about the relation of buildings to power, and then focusing on, in on this building and Canberra. Um, the fact that not much changes is in some way leads me to my first point about this relationship between buildings and power. Um, architecture has great inertia. It, it produces a kind of durable change. We might say well, architecture doesn't change anything, but whatever it does change lasts for a long time. You put enormous amounts of capital into a particular place, uh, it tends to remain in that form. So I'm going to start with a few observations about these general relations and then return to Parliament House later on with a gentle critique and a little birthday gift. So if power is a general capacity to get things done, then political power is but one dimension of this very strange concept that often seems to be everywhere yet nowhere. So when we look at a place like Parliament House or Canberra as a whole, it would seem to be all about locating the centre of power in space. Yet another principle in understanding this relationship is that power often works by hiding itself in plain sight and in silence. Architecture and urban design frames space, both literally and symbolically. In the literal sense, our lives take place within the clusters of rooms, buildings, streets and cities we inhabit. Our actions are enabled and constrained by walls, doors, rooms, corridors, streets, fences, gates, guards. As a form of discourse, buildings and places tell us stories they construct narratives and mythologies. And in each of these senses, architecture frames the places of everyday life. A frame is also a context, sorry, also a context that we relegate to the taken for granted. 
Like the frame of a painting or the binding of a book, architecture is often cast as necessary yet neutral to the life within. Most people, most of the time, take architecture for granted, as we are now, really. This relegation of architecture and space to an unquestioned framework is the deepest linkage of built form to power. As Pierre Bourdieu puts it, the most successful ideological effects are those that have no words and ask no more than complicitous silence. The more that the practices of power can be embedded in the framework of everyday life, the less questionable they become and the more effectively they can work. When we think of political power, we generally refer to the power of the state over its citizens. And here we must make the key distinction between power to and power over. The term power derives from the Latin poter, or to be able, the capacity to achieve some end. Yet power in human affairs generally involves control over others. This distinction between power to and power over, between power as a capacity and as a relationship, is fundamental. Power too is the original or the er form of power, the capacity to act, empowerment. While less primary, power over is much more complex and incorporates a range of forms and practices like force, coercion, manipulation, seduction and authority. These practices have all been crucial connections to, to architecture and urbanism which I've explored elsewhere in relation to building types such as shopping malls, corporate towers, courthouses, housing enclaves, public space. This is a pretty big topic. Authority, merely one of these really, is, one form of, is a form of power over that is integrated with the institutional structures of governance. And it relies on an unquestioned recognition and compliance. It's the most pervasive, reliable, productive, and stable form of power. But it rests upon a base of legitimation. We recognise the authority of the state as legitimate only when it is seen to serve the larger interest. The key linkage to architecture here is that authority becomes stabilised and legitimated in part through its symbols, the trappings of power. The nation state is not visible, it's what Benjamin Anderson calls an imagined community that must be rendered visible through an iconography of landscapes, buildings, maps and monuments that affirm the story of the nation, enabling citizens to imagine what they can't see. The anthropologist Clifford Geertz puts it well when he says, no matter how democratically the members of an elite are chosen, they justify their existence and order their actions in terms of a collection of stories, ceremonies, insignia, formalities and appurtenances that mark the centre as centre and give what goes on there its aura of being not merely important but in some odd fashion connected with the way the world is built. When such narratives are embodied in architecture and urban design, the ways the world is built resonate with the ways the city is built to become part of this unquestioned framework of political life. If citizens take the state for granted, then we enter into this silent complicity and state authority is confirmed. It's common to conceive of the nation state as somehow timeless when it is a relatively modern institution that is mostly established by violence. Australia is one of the more democratic and just societies on the planet, yet it was founded by the violence of a British invasion and the authority of the state thus established is based in part on forgetting that founding violence. Thus new mythologies such as the Anzac myth are born to legitimate the nation state and they're rendered permanent in vistas, buildings and monuments. In 1651, Thomas Hobbes famously observed that the state is our defense against the natural order of dog eat dog. State power involves a contract, he says, between the state and its citizens. We surrender our autonomy, our power too, and we grant the state power over us in order to avoid a life that would be, in his famous words, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. While Hobbes was defending a monarch on, under conditions of a civil war, that was the 17th century, and the principle remains for a democratic state. State power is not natural, but it is a form of contract between the state and its citizens. On the frontispiece of Hobbes' book, Leviathan, which is shown here, the king is depicted transcending the landscape and the city with his body formed 
by the bodies of the citizens. He holds the symbols of force and religion in each hand, and the trappings of power below include castles and churches, along with weapons, instruments of torture, and the star chamber. These days, we seek to break with the monarchy, to separate church and state, and to hide the torture. The legitimating images have become much more sophisticated. However, Hobbes' key insight retains its resonance that the state is a contract to protect citizens and therefore it requires our agreement, which we can always withdraw. This idea of power as embodied in citizenship can be linked to the work of Hannah Arendt, who defines power in a slightly odd way as something that is produced when citizens act together in the public space, in public realm. For Arendt, power is the opposite of violence. In her inspiring words, power is actualized only where word and deed have not parted company, where words are not empty and deeds not brutal, where words are not used to veil intentions but to disclose realities, and deeds are not used to violate and destroy, but to establish relations to create new realities. Power is what keeps the public realm in existence. This brings us back to the distinction between power over and power to. Practices of power involve a complex intersection of top-down and bottom-up processes. Power over, <coughs> sorry, power over and power to, formal and informal, authoritarian and democratic. This requires a multi-scalar understanding of power that doesn't presume that top-down trumps bottom-up. The revolution in thinking about power that was initiated by Michel Foucault is crucial here. Power is not something that is only that is held by agents so much as it also produces a disciplined subject. Power is distributed and exercised through the micro practices of everyday life, including the gaze of surveillance and the architecture of segregation. At the smallest scale, any building plan mediates social encounters through privileged enclaves of access, privacy, amenity, and control. Buildings produce and reproduce zones of surveillance on the one hand, together with privacy and privilege on the other. Some capacities are enabled while others are constrained. Deleuze and Guattari take this much further to celebrate the informal rhizomic practices of power that operate within and against the tree-like formal hierarchies. And in this sense, power is neither good nor bad. It is what produces our world. The relationships of architecture to power then operate at multiple scales, and they are a complex assemblage of formal and informal. Before I digress too far into the theory, I want to take a brief Cook's tour of some of the top-down power over practices, the trappings of power in urban space. The urban design schemes that are used to legitimate the state, when we look globally, have a good deal of congruence, regardless of history, culture, or degrees of democracy. These are regimes of large scale urban order, replete with expressions of stability, straight lines, or strict curves, expressing discipline, hierarchy, and social order. It is the condition of the state to maintain law and order, and the forms of legitimation of the state tend towards the stable, the strict, the straight. This remains the case from the older centres of power such as Beijing, through the more modern ones such as Paris, Washington and Delhi, and even the more recent designs of Kuala Lumpur and Astana, Kazakhstan. The word state shares the Greek root sta with words like stand, stable, static, statue, statement, standard, stage, status, establish. To legitimate authority, architecture and urban design needs to signify a stable system of law and order. An ideal form such as the pyramid and dome often emerge to embody the expression of stability, hierarchy and symmetry. A centralized order where power is concentrated and flows downwards and outwards. Relative scale works to signify power through the ways that urban prominence is read as dominance with large scale urban form or open space in figure ground relationships. A center of power is often established by a, a vertical or horizontal expanse at a scale that overwhelms the human subject. There's an aesthetic thrill, a pleasure, in, indeed even being overwhelmed by urban scale 
a sense of the sublime to which we surrender when intimidation is mixed with awe and inspiration. The key institutions, the monuments, the rituals of state authority are often arranged through an organization of street vistas to produce a collective orientation toward the centers of power. And when major transformations of political power occur, we often see transformations of urban form that produce a reorientation to the new monuments, avenues and citadels of the new order. If the state can be identified with the landscape and nature, then this becomes a literal naturalization of political power. The ground or earth on which the city is based is the most stable of images. Architectural styles with a strong degree of formal order, symmetry and hierarchy are the most easily deployed as representations of law and order. The hierarchical order of the neoclassical resonates well with the hierarchic order of the state. Yet the neoclassical is linked equally with both democracy and tyranny. There are no architectural styles that cannot be used to legitimate authority. Gothic revival architecture was chosen for the British Houses of Parliament where it resonates with traditional the traditional connection of church and state. Yet throughout much of the British Empire where power was less legitimate, neoclassical held sway. Vernacular architecture too can be used to evoke the idea that authority is indigenous and authentic. Hitler's passion for the German vernacular linked to blood and soil remains a bit unnerving. Finally, urban design works as a stage set for the urban choreography of political rallies or the symbolic display of military force. The most interesting current version is enacted regularly on Kim Il-sung Square in Pyongyang. This brings me to another key principle here, which is that the need for the legitimation increases as power becomes more authoritarian. The more legitimacy you have, the less you need the trappings. In an effective democracy, they would effectively disappear. Extravagant expressions of legitimacy through urban form tend to emerge in new or vulnerable states. Whenever you see an image of the leader on a billboard, um, you can, it's, a, it's a dead giveaway. The Parthenon was in part a legitimating gesture that was linked to the threat to the Athenian state from the Peloponnesian War. New Delhi was built by the British just as their power in India went into decline. Indeed, the design of the new Parliament House has been interpreted by James Werrick as a response in part to the legitimation crisis produced by the Whitlam dismissal in 1977. Such crises occur when subjects of authority lose faith in its fairness. With their capacity to stabilise identity and symbolise a grounding of authority in timeless imagery, architecture and urban design are regularly called on to legitimate power in a crisis. I want to zoom down now and change scales from the general to the particular and from the large to the small. British parliamentary parliamentary democracy was born in a chapel of the medieval palace at Westminster where the first House of Commons was formed in 1547 in the 13th century St Stephen's Chapel which was a chamber of about 11, 12, sorry 20 by 11 metres with an altar at one end and tiered choir stalls lining both sides. The altar position became the speaker's chair and members filled the stalls. The choir boys were replaced by the opposing parties no longer singing to the same hymn sheet. The room was remodelled by Christopher Wren. This illustration here shows that in another 150 years later in 1707, adding the galleries and the central table, but the spatial structure remained identical. The building was raised by fire in another 150 years later in 1834, and Charles Barry designed a new building with a relocated and expanded chamber, now 21 by 13 metres, set deep within the building after an enfilade of halls and lobbies. The old chapel just became the, the first or the second of these lobbies, if you like. The practice of oppositional debate was further inscribed here as sword lines about three metres apart were woven into the carpet, beyond which debaters were not permitted to step. This was designed as a space where it would be safe to be as aggressive as you might like, a crossing of swords without bloodletting, but close enough to see the whites of your opponent's eyes. This building was the centre of an extraordinary amount of debate over issues of style, which I alluded to before. 
It was the key building of the 19th century Battle of the Styles, the struggle for priority between Gothic and classical revival for prominence in public architecture in Britain. My interest here, however, is on the way the debate over style obscured a non-debate over the spatial program, which was, at that time, removed from the control of the architects. However, this debate did erupt a century later when the Commons Chamber was bombed in 1941 and Winston Churchill, in a speech arguing for its replication, made his famous claim, which has become a catch cry of architectural determinism, we shape our buildings, thereafter they shape us. While I'm not normally a fan of spatial determinism, this polarised spatial structure with the two parties facing off at sword fighting distance does produce particular forms of discourse. The speaker on the raised remnant of the altar calls for order as members are reduced to shouting to be heard. This is a spatial framework that favours those such as Churchill who are skilled at loud debate from a standing position. In this sense, it is also a men's house. Being naturally less dominant in height and voice, women are disadvantaged. In her recent anthropological study of the British House of Commons, Emma Crewe argues, quote, many women feel uncomfortable and hesitant in the chamber. Men have more confidence, aggression, deeper voices, and relish the quick repartee. Churchill's dis determinism was, in my view, a bit overstated, but the House of Commons is his best evidence. The behaviour it produced and still produces, rarely occurs in other public debates or courtrooms where the issues being debated are more important than the spectacle. The House of Commons was a place where Churchill excelled, where rhetoric trumped policy. His arguments won the day and the House was rebuilt to a congruent design, but this was not for the first time. Australia's first provisional parliament from 1901 to 27 was the Victorian Parliament House in Melbourne designed by Peter Kerr and constructed in stages from the 1850s to the 1890s. It was structured with the two houses flanking a central hall and a main axis, as at Westminster, but here located much closer to the street entry. The Commons Chamber, here called the Assembly, closely resembled the British original <clears throat> with oppositional seating that was later converted to a horseshoe. The Melbourne grid was not designed as a capital and the chosen site was then on a hill at the top of Burke Street, just off the grid, where it remains as a centrepiece of Melbourne's so-called marvellous Melbourne period of the 1880s and 90s. However, once the 1890s depression collapsed the economy, the dome of the building was never completed. But this, of course, opened up other opportunities. One that I like is this rather polemical vision by ARM architects for a grand function room on top, surmounted by a large public open space and a crown of solar collectors. While we might debate the design details, this is the kind of design thinking I think we need for a democracy of the 21st century. Australia's Parliament House moved, the Parliament moved to Canberra in 1927 and the second provisional Parliament House designed by John Smith Murdoch was completed. The structure here was very similar to the Melbourne building with two houses flanking the central hall again with a relatively direct entry from the street. The House of Reps was much wider than the original and in a horseshoe formation. However, the structure of oppositional debate at sword fighting distance was maintained. The central hall was highly accessible with members, the public and the press all crossing paths. Unlike its British predecessor, this building also housed the prime minister and cabinet in one corner of the ground floor, but with no executive enclave. A tradition of strong press access to politicians grew in this building. As Michelle Grattan wrote at the time, the old building is an intimate place. If something is going on, it literally buzzes around the corridors. Ministers, backbenchers, staff and media cannot escape one another. In this circumstance, informal rules emerged to regulate such contact. One of these was that members would make themselves available for doorstop interviews on entering and leaving the building provided they were not asked for public comment in the corridors. So the front steps became the scene of many such interviews. The provisional parliament was not an effective emblem for a growing nation and it outlived its functions, but the paradox was that its dysfunctionality clearly had a democratic function. The late Robert Haupt described it at that time, 
as a cheek by jowl jumble of corridors, rooms, cubicles and annexes so hated by those who worked there and yet so vital to our intimate political style, in which a chance remark in Cabinet in the morning could become a pointed parliamentary question to the Prime Minister in the afternoon, the lead item on the evening news and the subject of a scathing political commentary in the following morning's press. Similar to the street, the corridor or lobby of a public building is no one's place and therefore everyone's. It is a place framed in such a manner that any conversation can be started or terminated at any time. It's a space between functions where the flows of information are as unpredictable as the flows of people. Some things may be said in a lobby that will remain otherwise unsaid and certain people may speak who may otherwise not be heard. It's a space of possibility. So this was a building that embodied the practices of democracy within its spatial structure. And as a platform for such intensities of encounter, the building worked like a small city. But in this sense, it did not work for politicians. The design of the new Parliament House was the result of a public architectural competition and is largely the work of the Italian-American architect Romaldo Gergola. However, it is crucial to note that the architects were not responsible for any part of the spatial programming, which is mostly what I'm going to talk about. The Parliament House Construction Authority produced two volumes of competition conditions that stipulated a clear segregation of people within the building and four separate entrances for executive, senate, house of reps and the public. Internal divisions were equally explicit, and I'm quoting, circulation space around and between chambers at chamber floor level should not be accessible to tourists. Citizens become reduced to tourists. Ministers and backbenchers were also separated, and I quote, ministers should not have to use a circulation system flanked by senators' suites. So this program largely determined the plan since it diagrammed the various parts of the building with the two houses as wings of a cruciform with the new executive on axis at the top. Any competition entry which did not reproduce some version of this diagram with its four distinct entries could not meet the brief. And this was, as my colleague Andrew Hudson pointed out in a previous part of this lecture series, this was one of the very few competition entries that did meet that brief. The winning plan was essentially four separate buildings in a cruciform with four entries for four classes of people whose paths rarely cross. The executive entrance is is on axis opposite the public entry and it grants ministers a high level of control over press con contact, indeed all members. It renders the doorstop interview voluntary and grants them media access on their own terms. These slides, by the way, which were taken nearly 20 years ago, you can no longer get anything like as close to that, to the executive entrance anymore. Within the executive block, each minister is also provided with a suite of about nine rooms and the spatial structure of this was completely determined and diagrammed in the, in the program. Such diagrams are the spatial genotypes of how power is practiced through spatial segregation. The minister's office is several segments deep from the access corridor and is structured to enable a back door entry and exit. Thus, just as the minister can regulate contact with the press as she enters the building, the same is possible with anyone entering or exiting the office. This spatial structure juxtaposes an entry for visitors, a formal suite of entrances on the left, with the informal suite of advisors and back entry exit on the right. This in some ways mirrors a very standard uh, genotype that developed over centuries from Western palace architecture where an enfilade of formal rooms leads to the centre of power, which is then serviced by an informal entry or exit, largely used by mistresses and informal advisers. The cabinet was originally named after a small room from the, uh, for these informal advisers, which was located near the king's bedroom. The general argument here is that the building has reflected a shift in power from parliament to executive that runs counter to the interests of the press and the interests of citizens. A survey of the press soon after completion found that a majority felt the building had caused an increase in the power of the executive, and this has been echoed over the 30 years since then. However, informal power works in multiple ways, and it's also been argued that the new building enables the plotting for leadership coups to be carried out in greater secrecy. And I think we've seen those increase in frequency as well. 
So a severely bloated spatial program here means the proliferation of corridors and lobbies that has kind of dissipated the intensity of the building. This has been commented on everyone from Barry Jones back when it was built through to more recently uh, Malcolm uh, Turnbull. The, the corridors, this points to a, the corridors of power being relatively dysfunctional here. While the spatial program was largely decided by politicians and bureaucrats, the architect's primary legacy lies in the forms of representation and the composition of the building. Burley Griffin's urban design for Canberra, as we all know, was to leave the site Capitol Hill as a public open space from which to look down and across the parliamentary triangle leading to the water. The decision to locate Parliament House on the hill is just one of a long series of violations of the Burley Griffin plan, which is driven by a variety of bu bureaucratic and political imperatives. One of the attractions of Jurgler's design was that it resisted the impulse for an imposing edifice. Instead, the building excavates several stories off the natural landscape, which it then reconstructs artificially. This tactic enables a very large building to blend into the landscape and one enters the parliament as if into the land it stands for. Parliament as a hill rather than on the hill. So citizens could initially walk on top to produce a potent legitimating image, although that access is now sadly denied. The public parts of the building comprise a sequence of spaces from the grand entry plaza through to the heart of the building. I'll make this rather fast, I know we're all familiar with this. The spatial and architectural narrative here proceeds from the grand plaza representing aboriginality and the desert to enter the building depicted in terms of the arrival of European civilization. The walls and building entrance containing the forecourt signify Greek and Egyptian architecture as they accentuate the sense of entering the earth and the rise of European civilization. The main entry space also signifies a colonial veranda which reconstitutes and frames the colonial gaze back over the aboriginalized landscape. The deliberate use here of a semiotic approach to architecture results in guides and guidebooks who are necessary to decode the building for citizens who must now learn how to see it. The grand foyer of marble columns is meant to evoke the hall of the old parliament house, but here it is stripped of its members. This is followed, of course, by the great hall and finally the new members hall flanked by the two houses. And here's the house of representatives. And why did we ever abandon that wonderful word commons for it? Uh, such, a, such a lovely word, commons. We, we called it a house of assembly and then the house of representatives. Has been expanded in size yet again, sort of dissipating the intensity, as if the architecture might ameliorate the intensity of political debate. And here we also find the programming of separate lobbies for the government and opposition. They enter through different spaces, whatever happened to the idea of a shared public realm. The new members hall, now closed, sadly closed. I was looking forward to visiting it this morning. The new members hall between the chambers is the symbolic centre of the nation. In the architect's drawings, this was the key node point of the building, filled with members chatting, lobbying. Yet members have no reason to be there and it's generally empty. The large square slab of water covered black granite becomes a mirror designed to promote contemplation to signify permanence and purity, surmounted by the pyramidal roof and flagpole. What it most evokes is contemplation of what kind of democracy we've become, together with a desire to throw coins and to wish that it were not so empty. The throwing of coins, the illegal, technically, throwing of coins, is a refreshing spectacle since nowhere on the site does the building provide any genuine public space for political speech. While the architects should have known that this would happen, the emptiness at the centre of Parliament is largely produced by the programme they were forced to follow. It can also be seen as an early and somewhat uncanny reflection of global transformations that were accelerating from the 1970s when this was programmed, now generally known as the rise of neoliberalism, the Washington consensus, or for some, a post-democratic condition. From this view, the power of the nation state is in decline as the global neoliberal consensus holds sway. The state becomes more corporate and political power shifts from the parliament and the representatives to the executive. Public cynicism about politics rises as commitment to democratic institutions falls 
and parliamentary democracy is viewed by many as an empty charade. Visible above the members' hall is the giant pyramidal flagpole, representing a symbolic joining of the two houses with the executive and public entry. Some critics originally argued that this is a weakness of the design, yielding as it does rather directly to a heroic pa patriotism and its likeness to the icon of the Italian fascists, a bunch of fascies lashed together with an axe. In my view, this is not a particularly helpful critique because these are just the normal trappings of power. The state always seeks images of disparate parts conjoined into an aspirational whole, and without the flagpole, one would not even see the house from a distance. So what might be done about this post-democratic house on the hill? With regard to Parliament House itself, I would suggest not a lot. Although I noticed Penley Boyd in the uh, Canberra Times the other day was suggesting we build, um, we abandon it, build a new, public, new Parliament House down by the lake, uh, something that we, we may do in time, let's see. But I have some other suggestions as well. It seems to me that the architectural, comp um, <clears throat> one can't change the circulation structure dramatically, nor shrink the building or its chambers. The architectural composition of the building is beautiful in many ways and will only be damaged by major changes. We could experiment with granting public access to the central hall because I see no reason why members should not mingle with citizens as they do with safety in the street every day. While this may not change the practice of politics, it would at least relieve the image of such an empty centre. We could also, of course, reopen the roof as a public park. The parliament belongs to its citizens and should not be expropriated in an endless and ultimately hopeless quest for security. However, if we were to think a little more broadly about this house in the hill, perhaps more transformational change is possible. At the larger scale of the urban landscape, Parliament House is a citadel. It's separated from the city by three ring roads, which renders it nearly impossible to approach on foot. The practices and representations of democracy have been segregated from the community. The building is at once for the people and also a systematic exclusion of them. The main approaches to Parliament House show it in a bushland setting an effect that has been achieved by encircling park parliament with a vast moat of parkland. While I'm sure there are many who will leap to the defence of this parkland, <coughs> spare me two minutes to just launch a small thought bubble wherein we might see this as a space of possibility. 90% of Australian citizens live in urban environments. We may complain about our cities and escape from them when we can, but we vote with our feet because cities are where most of the jobs and opportunities are. Canberra is a city that pretends to be bushland and achieves this only with a very low density and a devotion to cars. The key challenge for all Australian cities is that they are so heavily car dependent. And while we rave on about walkability or the 20 minute city, we so rarely build it. The most popular parts of our cities are the highly walkable inner city neighbourhoods, often low rise but medium density, with a lively mix of places to live, work and visit, serviced with good public transport. So why not turn the moatland of parkland, enclosing Parliament House, into a new inner city? Even if we were to leave the 20 hectare citadel within, there's a something, there's a 30 something hectares becomes available within a 400 metre walking distance of the centre. This is just a rather amateur sketch of what might happen if this area were developed to about four to ten storeys while leaving the triangular slice facing the lake clear for symbolic purposes or perhaps an Aboriginal embassy. If similar visions were developed by the many good urban designers now practising, it could house a substantial population with facilities and opportunities within walking distance of Parliament. If programmed with a mix of residential, office, retail and other uses, then this could become a popular new suburb of Canberra. This is just a thought bubble, really, but why not use some innovative and agile thinking to demonstrate how a city can work? A smart city, a healthy city, a walkable city, a productive city, a sustainable city, a creative city. Invent your new slogan for the next decade. A citizen is a denizen of the city. <clears throat> this would put the city back into citizenship reframing Parliament to reflect where 90% of all Australians live, putting the politics back into the polis 
where it might also help to legitimate the authority of the nation in a different way for the centuries to come. Thank you very much. I'm told, we, I'm told we have some time for questions. Yeah. You are. Um, so we have a bit of time uh, for some questions. I think Professor W's been provocative, so I think there'll undoubtedly be some people with counter views in the audience. Um, is anyone, if you want to ask a question, just come to the mic, or the mic might come to you even. Thanks, Philia. One of the things that's reflected in the opening of this house on the 9th of May is the fact that the old Parliament House opened on the 9th of May and our first Parliament met in Melbourne in the 9th of, on the 9th of May. Would making Australia Day the 9th of May bring a focus back to the Parliament, albeit with some shortcomings, as the place where the country does unite? Bob Hawke said in the opening that this building would become the um, instrument of our unity. I wonder if you could comment on that as a way of uh, reviving the meaning of the parliament for us. It seems to me that changing the date of Australia Day um, is inevitable, but I'm not going to comment on what date it should be. <laughs> I think there was a question a bit further forward. Thank you for your address. Uh, you seem to... Uh, in. Uh, to summarise your, your address, you've highlighted uh, that uh, the Parliament House we have here is a result of an architectural competition rather than a competition to make the most functional uh, Parliament from the point of view of access to the people uh, and representing them in the way which a democracy should work. Could you uh, give us examples of Western democracy, Parliament Houses in Western democracies which much more closely meet the uh, the attributes which you feel are, are desirable, um, bearing in mind the one we used to have. I think the one that we used to have is a is not a bad model. Um, this is not an area that I've done much research, so I'm not all feeling all that competent to to compare it with all of the other models, if you like. Um, I I do think that the act the chamber with the the, where the two-party and oppositional two-party model uh, opposing each other spatially, uh, we, we need to rethink that because I do think there's an element of architectural determinism that operates there and indeed a gender bias. So I think that is, is worth looking at. Um, I don't have a model of a, of, a, of a different form that I think you know, works particularly well. If, if, if I have a model of democracy, it is that model that goes back in a sense to Hobbes where we see democracy is based in, um, in citizenship. It's based in us, and it's based in, 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 a, in a power that resides uh, in the people. And then what forms of architecture flow from that? I, th I think that, w watch that space, because I think that perhaps to some degree, I also said that when, um, when democracy is truly legitimate, the trappings of power tend to disappear. So one answer to your question is that you won't see the trappings of power. You won't see the images of a democracy that's really working does not need to announce itself. Mm. Uh, there was a question a bit further along, gentlemen. Yeah. Kim, picking up uh, on your thought bubble at the end, as illustrated in front of us, what do you reckon the real estate values would be of those surrounding? <laughs> Um, areas and um, could I mischievously suggest to you that all you are doing is putting a reinforcing citadel of the elite around the already isolated um, Parliament House. You might take the first one as a comment. <laughs> <laughs> I realise I was opening up a can of worms here. Um, look, let, let me open up, let me go f right down that path. I mean, the, of course, in, in, in its worst case, this is, this is neoliberalism at its worst, simply um, giving over more and more public space to, um, to, to private markets and to profit. Uh, that's certainly not my intention. My intention was really to point to what I see as a, a serious problem with, with Canberra. Canberra just lacks the intensity of a real city to some degree. And that, that this, that there is a, the, the production of waste corridor space within this building uh, 
is reflected in my mind at the larger scale in Canberra, that cities work better when there is a, a level of intensity. You know, I, I haven't been in Canberra for a while, but I arrived just at afternoon and I had a long walk right around the Parliament House and, um, and th through that bushland. And I saw almost nobody, again this morning I walked to Parliament House. It's, it can be done, it's not easy. Um, again, there's nobody there. I mean, I see it as underutilised for an urban space. I love the bush, you know, I love escaping the city. But when I'm in the city, I want to be in the city. Um, I think there are ways of, of managing urban development that are in the public interest, that are in a true democracy, the, the forms of urban... A true democracy does not stop urban development from happening. It does not wipe out markets. It does not stop developers from making a profit. It simply manages that in a way that that produces a public benefit. That's what I'm proposing. Mm. There's a query just at the back, Philia. Thanks. Thank you for your talk. In response to your last comment, may I say that I cycle regularly through the paths um, on my way into Civic, through the love paths, through the lovely bushland, and others do also. Joggers use those paths regularly at lunchtime, so they are well used. Uh, but I wanted to ask uh, a, a different question. Uh, you have spoken about the intimacy of the old Parliament House, and of course we all know how members and ministers mingled much more freely in the old Parliament House. Uh, in the new Parliament House, the executive is remote. And as you have said, that has made the executive much more remote from the ordinary members of the Parliament. As I understand it, that physical separation was part of the design brief. Uh, my question is, who was responsible for the design brief? What sort of people were they? Were they officials? Were politicians were inv involved? And do you think they understood the long-term political implications of that physical separation? Um, the, the people who were responsible for the brief it were a mix of uh, bureaucrats and politicians, is, is, is my understanding. And, uh, and were they aware of the long-term... And, 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 and why did it go that way? It went that way because that's the way they saw their interests. I mean, if you ask a politician whether they want to be ambushed uh, at, a, at, a, at a doorstop interview, then the answer is no. If you ask them whether they would like more control over the relationship with the press, then the answer would be yes. I mean, it, it, there's no point in blaming politicians for pursuing their own interests or, or indeed um, the bureaucracy. The, the, the problem was that there wasn't input, there wasn't long-term input from anyone who understands uh, how buildings really work. That's, I think, the, the, the deeper problem. So that's the answer to the second part of the question. Um, no, they didn't understand the long-term consequences. That, that, that buildings and architecture work in a lot of very subtle uh, ways that are not usually formally written down. No one formally says that um, what is supposed to happen in a, a lobby or a corridor any more than anyone formally says what should happen on a sidewalk. Um, but these are very interesting places because they enable so many different things to happen and they enable so much mixing and encounter. It's the chance encounter uh, that, in, in a sense, is so productive there. This is, how, this is how cities work, you know. Good cities work by bumping us into each other in, in walkable ways where we can stop and have um, an encounter or a conversation uh, with each other. It doesn't work, of course, when we're in cars. So, and the same thing happens at different scales. So that the, the inner cities that I was talking about as being a model for the th sort of thing that we should perhaps reproduce here uh, is, uh, is part and parcel of what happens inside uh, public buildings as well. Probably got time for one more just at the back there. Hi, I just wanted to ask, um, I mean, this building built in the 1980s was just at the forefront of communication changes and I'm wondering how much criticism of the building is actually relates to this device. And having just been on a bus in Sydney or a tram in Melbourne, nobody talks to anyone because they're all on their phones. Parliamentarians are no different, the press is no different, you can go to the cafe, no one's talking. 
So how much has the way we communicate now in that we would rather text someone than meet them in a corridor affected how you view this building? Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I, um, I mean, the, the new information technologies enable us to, in a sense, to avoid that kind of random contact to some degree. And I'm simply suggesting that there's, that there's something about face-to-face uh, um, -face contact, which is re very, very different. That when you, um, when you communicate through uh, mobile phones, you're generally communicating with people with whom you already have a relationship. And, and there's nothing random about it. So it's a very, very different. It doesn't replace what happens in streets, sidewalks and corridors. So I think it still remains important. I, your question seems to be, you know, what was the, perhaps the impact of that? Certainly the, the widespread use of mobile phones was not uh, prevalent enough in the 1970s to have impacted on the programming of this building. So I think it's uh, come later. Are you suggesting that, the, uh, that, that our tendency to, 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 to be, have our eyes glued to screens has prompted the criticism of the Parliament House. Yes. I don't necessarily see that connection. Well, everywhere in that fire That we've become more atomised and therefore we, we don't... I mean, it's it more likely to lead to less criticism. I mean, um, if I'm glued to my Facebook, then I can wander the corridors of this building without any kind of critique of it at all because I won't be watching it. It'll be just passing by. Yeah, I suppose what I'm, say what I'm saying is, and it's my observation of just generally, people, even in shopping centres and places where you provide places where people can meet, yeah. they don't tend to do that anymore. They very much focus on their own business, talking to the people that they want to. It's a bit like, uh -huh. the, basically I'm saying it's an impact, not an intention. Yeah. Look, I don't really go along with this notion that, um, you know, the technology's changed and therefore everything's changed. I mean, some people say, oh, well, you know, public, public space is now obsolete because everything happens um, on the internet or everything happens on screens and in virtual space. I mean, um, what are you people doing here? If that were true, um, <laughs> you wouldn't be here. So face-to-face uh, -face contact um, survives and indeed it thrives in many ways. And, and cities, uh, why are cities thriving? Why are people moving to cities? Why are cities the places that are producing uh, the ideas that are producing the jobs? Um, it's because cities are productive and they're, and they're productive because they are sites of intensive face-to-face -face interaction. That's the primary pr productivity of cities in my view. And it hasn't become obsolete and it won't become obsolete and that information technologies will change the way in which that's seen and indeed it can even stimulate kind of face-to-face -face contact when, when you um, make contact with people uh, in virtual space, there's often that leads to a face-to-face -face contact as well. Mm. Okay, well, I think um, we're just about out of time and I wanted to say thank you very much, Kim. I think it was a very thoughtful talk and that it's um, challenged us to think a bit more about the space we work in. Um, it feels a great privilege to work in this building in some ways, but yes, it does have its... Uh, uh, things that, are, that determine outcomes a bit in, in t how it's been designed. Um, I was intrigued to know that, that um, how that might have related to the brief the architects had um, that was news to me. So thank you very much. I think we've all learnt quite a lot today and um, enjoyed it immensely. Okay, so thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.